Welcome back to Champion Select for Game 2, FlyQuest versus Cloud9. FlyQuest got Dragon Soul, won Game 1. Cloud9, with the side selection, chose Red, mm. which is the same side that FlyQuest selected at the start of the series. And that's surprising, because most games, after they lose, they opt to go on blue side, so they clearly have, you know, value on red side, and let's see how they use it in drafts. We were wondering off camera where the Callisto would go if they would let Masu have that on red side. The answer is no. They've taken out Callisto Huey and then Jensen's Oriana. Yeah, and just the quote on the screen from Fudge just talking about how it's just really difficult to, uh, you know, pick against or blind pick in general versus uh, Whippo. So yeah, I mean Whippo blinded last game yeah, and he had true. two bands on red. But, yeah. Um, and he's still absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean okay, Renek and Grax yeah. is like a snooze fast. Like, just just start the game at 15 minutes and then maybe something might happen. You were having an existential crisis about how the Renek and Gragas top lane matchup plays out past 12 minutes. Like, what's the point of even trading? <laughs> yeah, just, just start proxying and have some fun. I don't know. Right off the bat, though, the Callista was banned by Cloud9. That is something we were pretty sure Masu was going to lock if it was up for first pick. But the Varus has gone through this draft, so we have the current Varus Senna trade. Yeah, and I, do, I will say this about a Senna draft for C9. I think one of my favorite drafts from them, uh, and when they looked so back, uh, was that kind of Nidalee Renekton topside, or just basically mm -hmm. anything that does allow them to play around topside, uh, because it does seem that Blabber is most comfortable usually playing around top lane, or when yeah. I think of Fudge and Blabber together, I do think of that first season they kind of spent together, uh, as we see the Nautilus locked in alongside Senna, and there are just so many different things you can bring to a Senna composition. Yeah, fully expecting this one to be Fasting Senna and just a big fat Nautilus. Any any questions around Berserker Senna was pretty much laid to rest the last time we saw him play it. Actually had a really high mm -hmm. um, stacking on mm -hmm. that game. So it's going to be nice to see what C9 tends to pair with this usually. I mean, I, I, in week five, if I remember correctly, they had like a Renekton on three or something and they had a Nidalee that followed. So like if you, this is like a decent amount of setup for a carry jungle. Okay, so they show the flex on Karma going to mid, so. True. The response should probably be mid lane here for C9. But, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a pretty strong, like, overall three ball comp for FlyQuest, kind of similar to what they had. I mean, they could just run back the Talia. Yep. Seems like a fine choice. It's interesting, though, FlyQuest clearly has a lot going Young. with this Karma oh, flex strategy. Nice. That's... That's aggression right there from JoJo. One yeah. of the picks we were looking at this morning. Yeah, Chovy played it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think JoJo would. This is a very JoJo style champion, yeah. right? Like we have seen him. Yeah, I mean, like after the Azir global ban, we were like, what is he gonna play to help out C9? And his first game was on Yone, so it's not totally a Chovy thing. I, that is funny though that it lined up in there. Yeah. I mean, this lane is pretty neutral. I mean, um, the lethal tempo nerfs don't really impact this lane because you're not necessarily fighting in the lane anyway. So once you get level, what, like seven or between seven or nine, somewhere the breakpoint is like lethal tempo is actually a buff. So um, kind of suits well for how uh, the Eon wants to play into the Karma lane. So I would say it's a pretty good lane and gives them the damage that they need because a mage for mid for C9 would not, I, I don't think he'd have enough damage in the team comp. So it sets him up pretty well. Mm -hmm. Trying to think about what four pick would be. Of course, it, would, it looks like it would be jungle. Yeah. Lee Sin had a pretty big impact from FlyQuest side. Inspired did really well on it. And it's actually just been taking over playoffs as a, as a pick in general. Yeah. I mean, Viego could pair well. Um, any bruiser like Xin Zhao could do well too. So, okay. They double ban for top, which I don't know if I agree with. I mean, they're trying to like cover what Yon might be hard against with the Jackson Renekton, mm -hmm. but um, any chance they're holding that Yon as a flex? Yeah, like, that, that's what I was going to ask. Is, do you, Yon top, yeah, do you yeah. think they'd flex at top? Um, I'm trying to think of like any potential good lanes right now, and it's just hard to like you can scale, but um, you've played some Yon top in your day. Yeah, I don't think you have necessarily <laughs> any like winning lanes outright, so I wouldn't. Really outside of like going top, outside of like Aatrox, right? Because that's the one that yeah. people get into most. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's kind of where I expect the blind to be for FlyQuest, Aatrox here, and um, let's see how the rest of this draft might shape out. Yeah, currently FlyQuest have a lot of range. They definitely need a tank. So I could also see them just blind picking Gragas, although mm -hmm. having 
a potential counter pick against that would be tough. And then I think, I mean, I'm actually really curious to see what Fudge counter picks with. Mm -hmm. They can have such a strong top side with Yon Sejuani and another melee in the top lane, especially if they get to counter pick the matchup. Yeah, I think something like a Gwen could be really good here, depending on what the lane might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. No one would actually be able to get damage. Yeah, your, get your, damaged your value damage. is really high, and the Flacco's is all very short range. So um, if it's not Poke Varus, which I don't think it will be, then I think one could be good here. Yeah. But with Gragas, I think most people default to Aatrox, and I think this lane is relatively neutral. Like, sure, Aatrox can have some pressure, but Gragas, after like level 7, just kind of neutralizes Aatrox, in my opinion, and um, it's kind of a stalemate. So, I'm expecting an Aatrox, but yeah. if he has something yeah. else, then I'd be excited. Dragus is such <laughs> a good pick on five, right? You're going, uh, like, just against Yone and the comp. Yeah. I mean, Rumble makes sense here. They do need AP for yeah. C9, mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily want to pick Gwen into Gragas because it's kind of a counter lane. So, um, kind of fits out what C9 needs here. Okay. Emily, which side do you like more? Uh, I actually really like FlyQuest comp. Um, I think they'll be able to pilot really well. I really like when Zinjao in particular has an enchanter on his side because he al mm. you already have all of these moments where he like pops ult and he suddenly becomes like unkillable. Yeah, he can and with really a karma the arena, behind yeah. him, um, they have a lot of range. When C9 are going into them, they have responses with both the Gragas and the Renata. Um, so I actually really, really like this comp that Fly has put together. Sounds good. Looking forward to an exciting game, too. Flowers, Kobe, Zale, take it away. Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome back. It's time for our second episode of this series, man. Game number it's one show. was an exciting Yeah, I'm down for this yeah. series. Sometimes the, sometimes the, the Will the, the sequel be as good as the original, Kobe? Yeah. Sometimes the pilot's well, not great. I, think, was. I was. think the sequel will be because Cloud9 are running back. They're like, you know what? Hard engage. Let's go harder. We must go <laughs> more engage. <laughs> they have guaranteed, like, Nautilus and Sejuani and a Yone with both with two uh, champions that have really good AoE ults that go over the top. Mm -hmm. I think that's a key. It's like, this is actually way easier to pull off because Rumble Ultimate and Senna Ultimate, the range is insane. And so you just need a, one of these things to connect from Blabber, Jojo, or Vulcan. And then you've got so much layer damage over top that uh, I definitely expect them to get more beneficial fights for themselves than we yeah. saw in the, in the last one. Mm -hmm. Also, the like range discrepancy isn't as crazy for FlyQuest. Yeah. They do have the Renata on their side now, though, which is a pretty big uh, like AOE that you have to avoid when you're charging into. But um, I definitely, I definitely think we're gonna also get spicier Cloud9 early. Like Blabber is playing Sejuani with uh, double solo laners who can help proc your stun. All right, as we are currently stuck in a pause, let's go ahead and toss things down to Raz, who's standing by for an interview with C9 coach Mithy. Perfect timing, honestly. Thank you for taking the interview. Uh, first question from my side. You guys had a crazy early game uh, start, but you weren't able to translate it. What went wrong in that last game, in your opinion? Yeah, I think we, um, like, because we killed them both, they got a few dragons. I think we could have planned better to give a few less. And then it just came down to fights, and I just think they they had the better end of us in in the fights. Uh, we, so we just talked about how we can you know be more connected, more decisive uh, moving forward. And yeah, hopefully it works out. Perfect, thank you. And the next question is just more so about looking forward. What adaptations are you making? You already mentioned like team fight adaptations, but you can talk about the draft a little bit. You guys picked up Yone, and we're getting straight into the game. So what adaptations are you hoping for with the comp that you guys just picked up? Uh, well, our, I think our fighting is should be a bit more straightforward this game, uh, which will help, um, you know, developing into the series. And then we are, we are red side, so those are the two adaptations. So. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And we're sending this one straight back to the casters. All righty, thank you very much, gentlemen, and welcome back, everybody. We are unpaused, we are locked in, and we are ready to go here for the second game. Azale, uh, Kobe, what do you guys think is the, uh, what's what's the secret sauce here for Cloud9? Flowers, we got to get, we got to jump on top of these invading top laners, man. All right, they're, all right. They're getting out of control. This is uh, every jungler's pet peeve. Bwipo, he body slams over. He gets the ward behind on red. Blabber, pretty smart rotation. He moves his Sejuani down to the other side of the map. But uh, the, the plague of top laners invading junglers for level <laughs> ones has... Uh, top laners revenge. Has gotten out of control. But We're yeah. ganking the junglers now. Uh, it's really smart because Whippo uses extra mobility. He knows that Blabber is starting on blue. 
Double range advantage is uh, on the other side now, and Vulcan can't really hook in here, so you kind of just have to take it, uh, which is rough. You, know, you can see Busio starting with the Guardian, so he's happy to take an early Look at that movement on the wall. <laughs> oh, Vulcan finds the dredge line there. The end Berserker now backing up versus that double range that we're talking about. Uh, so when we had Sven on, he was kind of talking about some of these matchups where you are playing, you know, a farming melee champion like the Nautilus into some of these difficult double range matchups. And in his opinion, a lot of times you actually just had to kind of choose a moment to basically just hook in, trade out your health bar, you know, get a good trade and then just TP back and try to play the lane from parity from there. Um, mm. So we'll see how they do want to play it out because it can be very difficult when they're stacking the wave on you to actually farm under your tower without giving up too much HP to the point where you actually can't really get any of the CS, right? So he's gonna have to pick and choose which minions he actually goes for and how much health he's willing to trade for those minions because this wave is huge and he needs to get some of it. And if we remember back to the previous game, it was around level three or four, I think, when Berserker and Vulcan were getting those isolated kills down here in the bottom oh, lane. I'm just gonna give it to him. I think okay. this is a little bit surprising. I mean, so I guess they don't really know exactly where Sedwani is, so they are playing a little bit more respectful. So he's gonna take a super early base, buy a longsword, you know, get another potion here. Uh, but the cost of this is that you're not punishing the un under turret whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, you're hoping then potentially that you could lock Vulcan into a longer lane with more combat power. But because he has a TP, I don't think they're going to get too much from that. So a little bit more of the kind of passive style there from uh, from Masu takes the safer guaranteed play, but does give a lot of breathing room there to Vulcan, where I think he would have been in tough to get much of that farm. I also want to talk about some of the biggest changes in this game compared to last game, where mid lane okay. matchup is very, very, very different. Um, obviously, Jensen in the last one was playing very safe. He was playing into a Talia Vi, uh, was just focused on farming, and he was going to be the big artillery later. But Jensen on the Karma here into the Yone matchup has gone for the Comet plus the Scorch. Uh, he so far has 64 extra damage off of the Scorch, 149 off of the Comets. Uh, landing all his comments are pretty easy with uh, Karma into Yone. Mm -hmm. um, but he's really trying to get all that pressure out. Oh, nice handshake on Vulcan. He tries to get away with the last auto attack in the air. When because Lightning won't hit him! The potion! He lives off a of potion juice! Man, that was so close. You know, I wonder if Inspired could have just W flashed there and actually finished him off, or would he have died had he done it? Uh, but it's going to mean Vulcan gets the TP back here, resets the health bar, now going to be in a decent spot. Uh, Blabber is going to arrive as well to try to cover. That was very nearly first blood here. That's about as close as it gets. Yep. Uh, drink your potions, kids. They keep the first blood away. And no one's going to even remember that now that Vulcan's gotten to teleport back with full health. Yeah. Uh, and Blabber has finished up his clear back out with a Kindle gem on the Sejuani to bottom side. Trying too. to make you remember it by showing you the replay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess we'll remember one more time here. Uh, but the good handshake pulled him back uh, into range and almost got it. Oh, that is crazy close. And that W is, yeah. If he W flashes, he gets him for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do you get stuck under tower maybe and die? And if your calculation was that I was going to hit him anyway, then you wouldn't flash. So that I one's mean, a tough one to call, but that was so close. Exactly. It's so close that I can't really fault him and say, oh, yeah, you should have flashed no, for that. No, no. And in a lot of those situations, it's not like you can calculate the ignite perfectly. I probably would have thought he was going to die to the ignite. You know, like he was really, really low there. So you wouldn't want to commit that play. Uh, but definitely a bit unfortunate, and it does mean that it's a good reset from Vulcan. He doesn't die. He's actually up, like, or even, excuse me, in farm, so he's feeling good. Yeah, exactly, and they, they've got the Senna rotating up to the Grubs, the classic play here. Um, extra benefit of playing the Fasting Senna on bottom side, just roams up to the Grubs, grabs some souls with the rest of the team, get the objective, and you want that with this Cloud9 comp. Uh, you know, they're looking for, uh, for Blabber especially here to start some soft off later. And if that would have gone through, if there would have been that last little tick of damage to kill him off, it would have been around the same time as game number one, where we saw the bottom lane kills happening. Now Vulcan's in some trouble yet again, as he finds himself alone against the power of Varus and Renata. But he's tanky enough to get back away to the safety of the turret, but he's got to go home yet again. I like that, though. You know, he's walking towards the upper wall, and so they're trying to block there. And then he opens up himself a hook angle to the side wall and is able to, in, in the end, walk it out. Yeah, what's we'll play for him? I thought they maybe could have body blocked him better. That's why I thought he was dead for sure, because I thought they were going to be able to stand on the other side of him and not allow him to get that. But Block both angles. Yeah, is going to be able to make it happen. And to be fair, it's hard because you have to be auto-attacking and getting damage, and you can't just be walking alongside him. Yeah. Um, so not quite able to finish him off. 
critical that Vulcan does stay alive, but it still will mean brought Pryo and that first dragon goes fly quest away. That ended up being their big win condition in the last game mm -hmm. and could potentially be the same in this one. Yep. All three of the early grubs for C9, the early Drake for FlyQuest, things pretty reminiscent of how uh, they might have looked back in that previous game. Back over in mid, the farm is even. We're talking about Jensen taking the Comet, taking the Scorch, looking to just be an absolute menace in the lane, but it hasn't slowed down JoJo's farming. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, JoJo probably has second wind, right? So I feel like that's always kind of the answer to these types of things. So you know, he's 325 healing from that. The Scorch has done 200 damage. Second wing D shield really strong in these matchups. It's mm -hmm. Like basically every single person takes it in melee versus range. And it is just about surviving and stabilizing. Because once you get to a certain point, you only can push these waves out very quickly. Yeah, and a lot of the priority that Jensen had from his aggressive play was in the early levels. Now that you've got level six on the Yone, you can threaten more all-ins with your jungler. Uh, as Jojo goes for some E trades here, uh, which are very dangerous, especially now Sejuani also has ultimate. Like that CC is immense. So you have to be a little bit more tempered with some of your harassment in the mid lane. Nice timing on the soul inbound as well. You know, he goes in and waits till the tether's just about to proc, then snaps back, getting maximum damage out with his E uh, and still being able to immune that. But obviously the monster Q there set up by the tether is always going to be nice little bit of trading. No grubs for another 90 seconds, but Blabber is heading into the enemy jungle on this top side of the map. He'll find Inspired here in just a moment, and he actually arrives in time to steal away the blue. Nicely done w. there. Just a bit of an early smite, you know, because there wasn't any vision on it, so he just blind stole it, I believe. Very nice here from Blabber. Levels up his uh, jungle pet as well. And you always get the extra ego on enemy jungler. <laughs> Level yes. up his ego. Uh, uh, nice, uh, very living in, important. <laughs> living inside their head. Um, honestly, it's uh, it's just like a Kindle gem uh, rush here anyways into Knight's Vow. So Blabber probably going to Knight's Vow up Jojo here. Make that Sejuani Yone duo even more fearsome in the early game and look for those skirmishes. Those are two champs that, you know, they have no problem staying inside Xin Zhao's ultimate inside that range, so it does make it a little bit more difficult for you. So up here in the top lane, one thing we haven't really talked about a whole lot so far is the farm difference between Fudge and Whippo. Fudge has a couple of waves of a lead built up over this Grog as Whippo stuck underneath the turret. Mana very, very pressured. And now Blabber's coming around from the side. He will walk over this ward. So Whippo knows that this is a possibility. Fudge at about half Blabber HP, tank. okay. They just immediately clear out the wave with Whippo's ulti. Nicely done there, getting rid of the threat. Meanwhile, back in bottom, it's Berserker and Vulcan fighting back. Nice dredge line on Busio. Dawning Shadow over the top, and Busio's about to pop. They won't get him just yet. Wind becomes lightning, and there's Inspired showing up to make the difference. Vulcan escapes back underneath the turret, but Berserker has already dropped, and Fly quest for the first ones on the board. Nice job here from Inspire taking advantage. He, he knows Blabber is going up to the top to go grab these grubs, so they do at least make them pay for it with a kill on the bottom side and a first blood kill at that. Um, also, look at his path. Minimap right now. You saw him use the Blast Cone over the back of the Dragon Wall, so Inspired avoids all of this vision on bottom side. The, the river was lit up. The Tribrush was lit up with wards. And just because of that Blast Cone, that's the only way that Zin can get in there behind them. And this time around, he flashes the W to make sure it connects. Yeah, nicely done there. And you could also see, I think that was pretty well played by Busio. And he goes for the Flash Q, doesn't actually connect, but he's tanking so much of the damage and the Sen is hitting him. He throws the bailout on Masu for the attack speed, for the move speed forward. And Masu's just hitting Senna. So Senna can't actually stay in to finish him off, even if Zin Dao doesn't show up. So. You know, using his HP as a resource there, tanking up as much damage as possible, gives Masu the space to get what he needs done. Man, I actually feel for the Cloud9 bottom lane there, because top of River was warded, Tribrush is warded. They're like, we are good, right? No way. Uh, immobile Zin Zhao is getting behind here, but... And now they're going to word out where the Blast Gun was. <laughs> yep. okay. Okay. Don't let him do it again. Well, you know that thing was just you, so it's dead now, but we'll look for the next just one. Just in case. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Those Blast Plants, they're sneaky. <laughs> they figured it out. Inspired was looking for uh, a little bit more presence in the game here over in mid lane, but JoJo with the soul unbound, it's so easy for him to get away from ganks on this champion as Blabber 
still just hanging around, making sure that Inspired doesn't try any repeat business over here. He's not going to be able to contest any of the camp or anything. You can see that Inspired has already secured the Ooh, chicken nice sport that. himself. Yep, nicely played up there. Whippo finally putting a little bit of pressure back on the Fudge, but Whippo has already used his TP returning to lane, and Fudge has his ready to cast. So once the Rumble decides to go back to base, he'll be just fine. And that was a pretty big sidestep, actually. You know, if Fudge gets hit by the ulti there, he could potentially be in a lot of trouble. And uh, he's going to be able to narrowly avoid that. Has taken the bad end of some trades here. So Fudge now going to have to go home. Just uses the equalizer on the wave. It is going to be a catalyst here. So it's going to be a row up for Buffo. All right, little adjustment here. You heard Mithy in the interview talking about, all right, we, we needed to get more of these early dragons. So we gave up yeah. way too many. They, they, again, this game got their six scrubs, mm -hmm. but have a much easier time uh, picking up the dragon because of the uh, bottom side of the map here on the reset. And you see Masu and Busio for FlyQuest have rotated up to top side for the lane swap. I love the placement and the timing of that barrel there from Whippo. He knew exactly when Fudge was going to be arriving back to the lane so that the barrel was completely cooked on maximum damage for that instant greeting. Hello, welcome yeah. back. Yeah. And the teleports always arrive between where you're teleporting and your uh, fountain, so you can always aim it easily. No equalizer, so Berserker's trying to hustle up here and potentially defend a dive. Fudge knows that it could be coming in, so he's backing off. All right, Masu will be the only one auto-attacking the turret for now. Would like to grab this third plate if he can. Berserker has arrived and made his way up. Masu needs a little bit more damage. Not quite going to get that plate. I will say I'm a little bit surprised. Vulcan's first item as the farming Nautilus is actually a Night Vow. So he's going Night Vow. So Cloud9 are going to go double Night Vow. It's likely going to be on uh, both Jojo and Berserker. Could be on Fudge as well. Uh, but this does mean individually he will be less tanky. Uh, and it can be, you know, one of the big strengths of this is that you kind of get the super tank Nautilus as we've seen in some of these previous games. Yeah, I mean, this item is just so efficient right now. Really good early source of cooldown reduction for yep, tank yeah. items where a lot of tank items got cooldown reduction kind of taken out of them or at least reduced. Um, but Knight's Vow also got the change this season compared to last season um, where it is no longer the pre-mitigation damage and you do get the, uh, you do take less from your connection. Plus, you get that uh, that extra healing from them if your carry is doing enough damage. It's definitely valuable, and I'm kind of curious on your take on this. You know, I generally build it, and I think two is even really good as long as I have two people that I think are like hyper carry type champions on my team. You're fighting over the Yone right now. For, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the only person that's worth a <laughs> yeah. vow, man. Like, I don't want to vow this poor Senna. I don't really want to vow the Rumble. So that's why. You I'll vow Rumble. I'll, I'll take okay. the one. You can you can you have the, the Yone. Prince, I get the king. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll get I'll get the Rumble. Rumble's looking pretty good to me. Azale. Won this deal pretty hard, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, but we'll win the game he's because of the knight, but he's the knight to the prince. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. It's, it's like he's a squire. Man, it's a, it's a squire's yeah. bow. Yeah. All right, well, the Rift Herald is going to go over to C9. They will continue their absolute control over these early game topside neutral objectives. Purple objectives. Yes. If it's purple, Cloud9's getting it, except huh? for maybe not Baron. <laughs> but. The other purple stuff has gone their way here so far in this series. Only a 400 gold lead for C9, despite the fact that they're the team that doesn't have the single kill in this first 15 minutes of gameplay. This one is not very fast paced. Both teams seem to be pretty comfortable just letting things move forward. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's been such a wildly different pace. Uh, than even the previous FlyQuest series, and definitely than the series we watched yesterday, where it had been so scrappy, FlyQuest has come into this one, and they seem to be much more the team that wants to be kind of like wax on, wax off, just deny what Cloud9 are trying to do, uh, make sure that they're taking the fights when and where they can get them. Uh, Cloud9, I feel like, has been hunting for some opportunities, but FlyQuest has just been so good at, at not really opening themselves up to it. Like, when you draft, Sejuani with double melee soul lanes, yeah. you want to be fighting, but they haven't been able to make anything happen. And this is one of the big benefits that a lot of people are talking about with having Inspired and Whippo on your team as two really intelligent shot callers. Uh, it seems like the whole squad is really focused. Their their comms have always been clear when we get the listen in. Um, and it seems like the, the in-game direction never feels panicked. So definitely a benefit here uh, with combining those veterans with the younger players on the bottom half. All right, C9 sending a squad up to the top lane here, thinking, okay, they really, really like to pick on JoJo. Last game, they really went after JoJo plenty of times. If they're doing it again, we'll be ready. But there's no such play being formulated by FlyQuest right now. It'll be up to Masu to deal with the wave about to collide with the mid lane turret. But now that the Herald's a part of this party, I don't really see bye a bye. way where this thing survives. That will be the first turret of the game, again, going the way of Cloud9. 
How many? Are they, how much damage are they going to do? I'm, I'm taking a look. Okay. Yeah. Figure it out. Oh, is it more than 21? It's still ticking. There. They got a lot more hits. Almost this 200. They got a lot more hits Wowie. this time. Wow. The, the, even the Void Mites have improved for Cloud9 in Ooh. game number two of the series. The sequel. The Void Mites. Uh -huh. The AI has improved. <laughs> Uh, I, is... I heard one person in the crowd kind of cheer for Void Mites, but then it sounded like they were embarrassed because nobody else was. <laughs> the one Void Mite yeah, enjoyer. Been there. Looking around like, nobody else likes Void Mites. Oh, oh, <laughs> just me. My bad. Oh, I All apologize. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're pretty cool. I actually think they're cute. They're goofy. I yeah. like them because they're goofy. They look Can like me little me. jumping potatoes. Yeah, that's that's goofy, man. I like, I like that. Now, three-man standoff here in mid. Inspired jumps in, but then right back out. Not really a whole lot worried about it. Handshake on Vulcan. Now they're worried about this. Dredge line to get himself away. Blabber's here on the front line. So Juani ain't worried about getting bursted here just yet. Low HP on Vulcan and Blabber both as FlyQuest punch him. I mean, that is the difference between an on-hit Varus and a Fasting Senna in what they're going to do to that front line, right? Mm. So Inspire goes in. He's not afraid at all. Vulcan has to flash out. Blabber's getting pumped as well. Masu was just ripping through those tanks. On hit Varus, if you have the safety, if you can stand and fire, is one of the best AD carries in the game at shredding these tanks. You can absolutely obliterate them, and he has the Karma. He has this Renata, who has a locket completed now as well. Yeah, if Cloud9 want to do a play, they need JoJo with his Kraken Slayer here, whacking away, stacking up his lethal tempo. Um, other than that, it's going to have to be the big layering of ultimates wherever Rumble is. And currently, Fudge split pushing on back on the bottom side. He'll still te teleport, obviously ready, but uh, so is everybody else's butt whippos. And I like the fact that you bring this up about the on-hit Varus, Isaac, and how, hey, yeah, this thing does have a really high DPS potential, but you have to make sure that it's properly protected and facilitated, because we're talking about the guy who's the young player, the rookie, the new dude on this squad of these guys that we've been talking about, how much game knowledge and just general perception of the way that League of Legends can be played is, like Inspired, like Wimpo, like Jensen, right? And so they're saying, no, 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 we can play support for Masu. This guy can get the ball into the end zone. And I think that he deserves that faith and that credit. In the final game of their series versus Team Liquid, he was on the Varus. This was the Poke Varus. But he was 11-1-12 and 12 in the final game uh, of that best of five. Really big performance. Uh, I think the entire team has talked about how much faith that they really do have in their younger players. I just think that's something that's been cool about the LCS this year is we've had a number of teams uh, that have really put faith in these young players to be able to get things done. Yeah. And they've really succeeded with that. You know, 100 Thieves obviously have been now eliminated, but a lot of their guys were these brand new young players who even made all pro who are really uh, successful for them throughout the year. And FlyQuest is similar to that. All right, does he get this blue buff also? Let's see. Inspire's trying to stay in and fight. Whippo comes in over the top of the body, slamming Berserker's under pressure. Now Busio's come to reinforce him. Hostile takeover over the top, but it only finds Flabber. Vulcan's still trying to get away, but the Equalizer puts the damage on FlyQuest health bars. Jojo, with the paint seal, tries to get himself back out. Another beautiful handshake coming out from the first team. All pro support means FlyQuest gets their second kill of the game. Cloud9 just have no damage without Jojo. He's the only one doing anything to this front line. So if he's not there, Flycast are like, yeah, let's fight. Let's start it up. JoJo does eventually arrive and is able to use the soul inbound, avoid the hostile takeover, but it just doesn't matter. Busio trying to flash away from this one. A lot of damage comes out, but not enough to kill him. Now Berserker's trying to escape from Inspired. Tries to sidestep the win, becomes lightning, succeeds at it. He'll live for now. Whippo and Jensen, though, still looking to see if they can keep this fight going. Jensen with a flash forward! And Whippo's big old belly pops them! They're gonna get one back for Fudge on C9's side, but he'll die to Masu's arrow in the air as he flies away on the blast cone. It's a four to one game for FlyQuest. So Jensen still deathless, 2 0 on the Carver now, flashing forward with these big Qs as FlyQuest chase Cloud9 across the map. They had already sent JoJo down to bottom lane uh, to go push the wave, and so JoJo was split pushing during that, and then the rest of Cloud9 decides to go for a pick themselves. Look at the mini-map right now. JoJo just teleported down there, so he does not have a ticket back to this fight in mid, and Cloud9 are trying to get the early jump on Busio. They realize they don't have burst damage, uh, so they're not going to be able to finish off the kill on the Busio, and then they have to scramble because FlyQuest had them completely outnumbered as they chase through. Spired goes down river, um, but Jensen, he's like, I'll tank the turret, goes in with the big Q, able to get it. Of course, Fudge is able in the end to burn down the counter kill, but it's still going to be plus one here 
for the side of FlyQuest as they get the two for one. Yeah, here are you. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Whippo on that Gragas, trying to uh, always look for these angles, always look for these engages. Last time around, we saw the build with the double scaling items, the Seraphs plus the Rod of Ages when it was played by Fudge. This time around, going for the Frozen Heart second instead, playing more of that frontline role. Yeah, you're not going to have the infinity scaling power and the, the mana spamming, but you're slowing down the attack speed from Yone. You've got the extra armor to survive the damage from him and the Senna. You can just throw yourself in there. So I got an update from production. They Hold did on. a poll in chat to ask chat if they also think void mites are cute or if they're ugly. 72% <laughs> think they're cute. I that's think that's a dub. <laughs> Guess we got some now cute like, void oh, mites. Cool. <laughs> there we go. Spam your IIS for the void mites. <laughs> they're the new favorite characters. Those little purple cuties. <laughs> the one guy in the audience is now vindicated. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> the void mites <laughs> reign supreme as FlyQuest is still only 200 gold ahead Ahead of C9 in this game despite leading by three kills. But it's just starting to feel a little bit reminiscent of last game where they're mm. controlling the fights, where you're, they're having trouble seeing exactly how FlyQuest is going to lose these fights. I mean, it has to be about JoJo, but there's so many ways to shut him down. We already got the fight starting off. JoJo's locked down. He's nearly killed here with a very, very start. Jetson shuts him down, and that's exactly the kill FlyQuest wanted to start this one up. Whippo's about to burn. He's got to be careful trying to get away over the top of the equalizer. The bailout oh! saves him. They can't get Whippo! He's too damn wide! FlyQuest getting two for nothing. The bailout plays always feel so good. He got hooked back in. They used the ultimate over the top to kill him, but FlyQuest, after those, they're just gonna go pick up Baron. They do sacrifice one dragon to Cloud9, but it would just be Cloud9's second dragon. It is just a single Cloud Drake, and them having the Baron, their push is going to be so difficult for Cloud9 to deal with. Look at Cloud9's comp. Where's the wave clear, boys? There's nothing. Uh, nothing at all. It's donate like sword. <laughs> yeah, keep on looking. <laughs> I mean, here, here's the engage. So this is the problem. When you're starting off a fight as the Yone, it is so difficult. Man. He's going to get knocked up by Inspired, ulted by Masu. There's all this CC that comes over the top. You get burst down before you can really get anything done. There's so much pressure on him, I feel, with this team comp. It's so low damage. And then this hook in, a bit unfortunate is I think that we're gonna get the kill regardless. Vulcan didn't realize it though, so he hooks in and unfortunately gives him the bailout, knows his mistake immediately. Yep, you can see the frustration uh, compared with the absolute excitement on the other side. I specifically love, never mind, we might get a chase down here. I specifically love in that play, Inspired, not auto attacking JoJo, not getting the challenge on JoJo, even though the Yone just engaged on him. He waits it out and then he uses his Zin ult to get the little baby bump backwards. Yep. And Yone, one of the most annoying champions to catch with the Soul Unbound, they're able to kill him off so early because of that. It's it's a mistake that a lot of uh, uh, Zin's out players sometimes do make, mm -hmm. accidentally getting that challenge on, but really heads up play from him and the rest of FlyQuest. And now with the Siege, you're just gonna 4-1 split push, Jensen take out top while the rest of the team slowly whittles away at mid. Yeah, Whippo not afraid to be here on the front line. Goes back in for the Demolish proc. Nice ulti from Blabber, but there's no follow-up again. If JoJo's not ready to immediately snap in and follow it up, you're not going to kill anybody. But even if he is, I just don't see how you win the fights. It's mm. Renata Karma. You hit the ulti even on Masu. You have JoJo go over the top. He gets bailed out. Hostile takeover comes. There's an... Wait, hold on. We already got a problem. JoJo is dead it's and done. Jensen is the one burying him yet again. For Four, zero, and two here on the Karma. A beautiful catch on JoJo, and they aren't done yet. FlyQuest have found Berserker right next to him, and they're still going forward. Inspired gets back out of the turbid aggro. Whippo's gonna be the tank now. He's gonna be a little bit careful about this one. Down to one third, but reinforced by the shields again. Jensen on this Karma, doing exactly what he needs to. 20 seconds on JoJo and Berserker both. All five men on FlyQuest are still pushing the enemy base with Baron for the next 30 seconds. C9 trying to scramble to defend here in this 3v5. First Nexus turret is already down. Fudge at 40% HP, completely zoned away by the inner flames as Blaver tries to just clear out some of the waves, but now he has to flash out to avoid the engagement 
from Whippo. Berserker and Jojo are finally back in the fight. They lock down Whippo. They follow it up with a paid seal, but Jojo has to snap back. He can't get a single kill. C9 rallies oh! for the defense, but Whippo gives him a drink. Masu picks up the kill, and FlyQuest are again in an advantage. 5v4, Nexus at half HP. Jojo dead again. Masu unstoppable. C9 can't hold it. FlyQuest are going up 2 0. Holy, FlyQuest absolutely own JoJo. And they're owning Cloud9 in this series. 2 0 the start. This, I gotta say, man. This is impressive. So impressive. And the, the drafts, I think, from FlyQuest have been really intelligent. Game one, they got massive range advantages. Game two, Cloud9 go at them with even more hard engage, but you're trying to hard engage into a comp that has such good answers for it. You know, you can blame JoJo for dying as he goes in, but it looks so hard for him to ever stay in long enough to actually get anything done. And there's so many answers to him when he does go in. Yeah. Even if you zero someone out the bailout, the handshake, all the CC, and he gets first down. He got bounced around by Gragas ultimate into handshake, into absolute destruction. They only got two kills as a team that game, but the two kills they got, JoJo wasn't involved. He ends game two, zero, three, and zero on this Yone that was supposed to be the damage delivery vehicle for the comp. But game number two is all wrapped up now. Reminder, tickets for LCS finals sold out immediately. But if you want to attend, we still got some good news. We've opened up additional seating to watch in the outdoor fan fest zone alongside Sneaky and Medios. There's only a few of these left though. So scan that QR code to get yours before they sell out. Now we're going to head on over to the LCS lounge to break down this series where FlyQuest is on match point. Dang. Welcome back to the lounge. Yeah, yeah two that was, uh, I feel pretty vindicated in my. You know when you like strongly. Again, no one yeah. was doubting your point. I know. I was <laughs> doubting. You. Whenever I strongly defend a draft and then it loses, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I was right. This draft, I was right. Uh, as we kick off our highlight package here. Yeah, I mean, so this is what I was afraid of for Cloud9 after their whole regular season and the way they beat 100 Thieves because I haven't seen Cloud9 like win a, a close game well. Mm -hmm. And unless they're blowing the other team out in lane, they don't okay. seem cohesive enough to generate victory. I want to pause and actually go through that play again just to point out one thing that casters uh, called out from the very beginning, uh, which was that Inspired played with vision really well. We talk about how junglers can play with vision, but mm. he basically takes a path that avoids all this giant block of wards here. So if you're wondering like why C9 thought that they were like safe as we play through the rest of it, uh, we can speed through it since we've already seen it. But um, since you wonder like why they were playing so aggressively, it's because they thought they were completely covered. Dokla, I want to ask your que like a question to you about this comp because yeah, you made the point about like being able to win a close game. I felt like this comp was just really tough to play for if you're a C9. Yeah, I mean, I think just the biggest thing for me is just a Renata pick into Nautilus. It kind of shuts down everything that C9 wants to do. Like they want to dive in and Renata just completely disables that from happening. And they have a lot of immediate CC, so Ooh. it's hard for Jojo to really do damage because they have a Veris he has a Verisol to think about, Gragas E and a Renata Q and a Renata ult. So it's really hard for him to get his damage off, even though he was really fed um, just by farming. But just this fight is like, so he goes in and then he's just Renata Q into yep. just Verisol into <laughs> W from Karma. Like he just can't play the game and the rest of his team just doesn't have the damage. I that was without Gragas ulti too. Yeah. What would make this comp way easier to play for Cloud9 is if they were about 8,000 gold ahead at this point. Yeah, actually. Because if, that, like, that's what happened when they just played had six yeah. items, they just he won every just early game by 4K. There. This Renata Gragas combo is, yeah. It's nasty. It, I mean, it stuffs every single thing that C9 wants to do. And then again, like I talked about enchanters with Sinjao, we didn't see it to its like full extent of how nasty it can get, but like basically it gets to a point where Sinjao just does not die. Yeah. yeah. It was disgusting. I mean, I will say Flaquist is outplaying uh, C9, but as well outdrafting. So uh, props to the coaches here. Yeah, I mean, thinking about the whole series, game one, Berserker and Vulcan popped off with a bunch of Callista yeah, kills, yeah. but they didn't turn it any into anything. Yeah. Uh, currently, Cloud9 has killed 12 grubs to zero. Mm -hmm. 
Their grub conversion to victory rate seems very low. Fair. I just, I, th this, I, I know I'm probably beaten on the same point, but it feels to me like this is the cloud nine that existed in like week mm -hmm. two or week five. Like it's just the very not dominant early game cloud nine that doesn't seem to have team comp or team cohesion. And then the FlyQuest team just seems like because they have such good players, they're picking really cohesive team comps, mm -hmm. like holding on for dear life for the first 15 minutes and then getting wins. Yeah, I think FlyQuest, at least throughout the entire split, I've loved their drafts the most of most teams. Like, they've always drafted well, at least going to 4-5. Um, so at least, like, usually it'd be Whippo and Inspired rounding out the composition. And they've always had, like, a scaling midline mage for Jensen. So most drafts you look at from a FlyQuest perspective, they scale better. Yep. And most drafts that you look through a FlyQuest, you're like, Whippo also just runs through team fights because his champion will just not just counter his lane, will counter the team comp. I got a question. Hit me. So what if the LCS teams hired professional lip readers, so then in between the games, they watch this yeah. and they figure out what the enemy team's saying? That's a great idea. Let's do it. I think a lot of the time they're just like, I really like the fruit that we had last week. If we yeah. could just <laughs> Arrow was so intense and he was giving Mossy a direction. I was like, yeah. what are they saying? Some coaches, I swear to God, they're so concerned about it because they'll be hiding their mouths while yeah. they're dra while they're drafting just for that reason. So I don't know if you're if you're a lip reader out there professionally, an esport team needs you. Yeah, bring a lot of value. I think Nukejuk was saying, "Oh my God, I drafted so well, guys. Just take a look at this draft." Yeah. Unfortunately, we do got to go. While we wait to see if C9 can turn it around in Game Three, they need to win three games in a row. Raz, you sat down with C9's top laner Fudge because he did win last week's Mastercard Player of the Week, and here's the interview. What's up? It's MasterCard Player of the Week for week one of playoffs. Congratulations, Fudge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm doing. <laughs> so rapid fire questions, 90 seconds to answer them. If you want to pass, you can pass. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, perfect. Let's get into it now. Favorite Oceanic teammate that you've had? King. Okay. Uh, what about Fantix? You're playing against him today. As a coach. Uh, he was my first ever coach. I liked him a lot. We are no longer friends. There <laughs> we go. Great answer. <laughs> Biggest all pro snub? Biggest all pro snub? Yeah. Uh, who's the AD? Uh, B-Boy. Oh, B-Boy? Great, yeah. Well, he's got first place. He yeah, got first yeah, place. Yeah, he didn't deserve first place. Oh, my God, okay. <laughs> uh, who's your MVP? Uh, Whippo. Favorite design champion? <clears throat> Aurelio. What is a pet, or what is a, your pet peeve on the team? People talk too much. Okay. Uh, what is a red flag that you have? None. Uh, what is your favorite artist in track? In track? Actually, or this is your track. favorite. Yeah, what's oh, your favorite artist? Uh, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, favorite fitness routine? Or what's your fitness routine? Mm, we just do C9 workouts every morning. They destroy our bodies. How do you keep focused on your personal goals? You keep focused on them. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, worst thing about queuing up in top in solo queue? When your teammates don't swap and give you last pick. Uh, favorite player to watch internationally? Zeus. Do you really have a secret SoundCloud? I do not. I lied. You lied? I lied. What? I, uh, okay. That's, that's a red flag, actually. I'm that gonna, is okay. That's I instantly lied. a red Sorry, flag. All right. That's going to be the end, end of that one. So, like, it's just, like, talk about, like, being able to play in Oceania uh, and what kind of lessons you had and, like, just your I mean, memories of it. It was my first ever split, right? And mm -hmm. I moved to a different city when I was 17, which was huge for me. I was really homesick. A lot of my teammates were, all, I was already friends with off like Discord and they were already pro players. I had a really good team. And Fantix was the coach of that, which was now Richard on mm -hmm. FlyQuest. Uh, it's kind of fun whenever I play against them remembering that <laughs> <laughs> how we used to be as friends. Yeah. And now it's sort of just like, eh. We don't even know each other anymore. That's fair enough. That happens to a lot of people. You just drift apart. Yeah. So maybe you guys connect after this series. Maybe yeah. you won't be, be feeling too happy after this maybe series. <laughs> we're, we're even more enemies after maybe, this series. Maybe. And pick the trophy up. And congratulations again on the player of the week. Thank you. Red Bull gives you wings. Make more good in the Kia Sportage X-Pro. Kia, movement that inspires. Dude, why'd you put your new rig in the basement? Didn't you hear? Bill's a good billionaire now. Basically, my new connection is so strong I can game anywhere. Check it out.
We've got Gamer Rocker, Gamer Floaty, Gamer Couch. Whoa. It's got wheels. Gamer Bench, Gamer Throne, and Gamer Mower. What's that? It's hard to game while walking downstairs. I get it. That's smart. Live like a gagillionaire with low latency everywhere. AT&T Fiber with all five. Look what I've just made. The perfect pearl. Not too bad, but check this out. <sighs> Whoa, a true Venus clam. Red Bull gives you wings. The new Red Bull Sea Blue Edition with the taste of Juneberry. Wings for every taste.